Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that your word is given to us, it's written for us. And Lord, in so we can draw comfort and we can draw information and instruction for life from it. So Lord, we ask that you would take and open up our ears, open up our hearts and our understanding to what it is that you have for us today. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, there's a lot of folks that struggle with the Word of God. They struggle with the Bible because as they read it, they have a hard time understanding it. The enemy loves to come and tell us that the Bible is difficult, that it's confusing, that it's full of contradictions, and that it's hard enough to understand that we shouldn't and we can't take it literally, and so therefore, well, in some ways it's not to be trusted. Well, we know that this has been the enemy's goal from day one, that he has set out and that he has purposed to try to discredit the Word of God by trying to confuse and trying to bring in that which God didn't say into the truth of his Word. And yet it's that Word that we depend on that is solely responsible for man's salvation and faith. Well, I'll be the first to agree that there are parts of the Bible, even now, after all of these years and all of the study, there's some parts that I still don't get. There's parts where there are difficulties. There's places in the understanding that are reserved for God that my puny little mind can't accept, it can't understand, it can't comprehend. But yet, at the same time, what I've found is that there's enough clear instruction within the Bible that if I focus on that, I'm never left wanting. You see, when it really comes down to it, I don't need to understand how it was that God spoke the world into existence. I don't need to know exactly what heaven is going to be like and be able to describe it in detail within my own understanding and reason, but what I do need to know is how to treat my wife and my kids. I do need to know how to interact with others. I do need to know how to make application of the things that are simple. And if we will do that, if we will understand that this truth that is given to us can be that simple, well, once we perfect the simple aspects of God's Word, then we can move on to the most complicated. I don't think that's ever going to happen in my lifetime, but you guys can go for it. So here's what I want us to pray this morning in understanding. Freedom comes from the truth of God's Word, and we learned just recently that Jesus Christ, as the truth being the Messiah made in flesh, is where freedom comes from. And so as we pray this day and every day, I want us to, to know that we need to accept the Word of God in a real and personal way. We need to open our eyes and have the Lord speak to us in such a way that yet simple instruction becomes easy for us to understand. The Apostle Paul has just stopped or just concluded speaking about personal responsibility in the church. We've talked about how this letter written to Timothy was literally, could be titled, How to Do Church. And that's more of what the Apostle Paul has been talking about. But now he's going to move away from those that serve and personal responsibility into talking about meeting the needs of those who serve in the ministry. Now, it's interesting because this is one of those areas of Scripture where it's really difficult for pastors to teach on. And the reason has nothing to do with it being a difficult concept or hard to understand. The reason that it becomes difficult is because, well, it speaks of how it is that the church, that being the body of believers, is supposed to care for and tend to the pastor, the elders, and the leaders in the church. And so it becomes difficult. It means that what I'm going to do today is I'm going to attempt to teach you how to take care of me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now if you think about it, that makes, makes for some hard ground to plow because any time that this happens, there runs the risk of, of it sounding self-serving, of it sounding like, oh, I want you guys to do things for me and for Dennis and for Sandy and for all the servants that work here and for all of the folks that are behind the wall, all of those that are in positions of eldership and leadership and just service. So it's hard. And yet, you realize that just a few weeks ago we had no trouble, there was no risk at all when I told you what our jobs were. Everybody agreed. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to be doing and that's what we want you to do. 
So today's going to be a little different. We're just going to let God's word speak. We're going to look at, at, at what it is that it talks about. And I think talk about the dynamic that happens within a family in relationship to what happens with elders and leaders and teachers and pastors and the body in which they serve. And I think that it's important that we do understand because God has a purpose, a means, and a plan by which we would operate. Look at what it says in verse 17 of chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. What this means basically is we should be paid twice as much as what... No, <laughs> the whole double honor thing, it's... It, you know, now, what it says is, it, is it's drawing an, an understanding that the calling that is on elders and pastors and teachers on upon their lives is that they're called to do things that most are not called to do. You see, God has called them to not only be concerned and to manage their affairs, their families, and, 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 and their lives, but He's also called upon us to tend after and be aware of and be concerned for and be involved in the lives of God. God's family, everyone that's here in the church. And while God wants us to look after our needs and make sure that we're responsible and accountable to Him for our own lives, we are also to be responsible and accountable for the lives of those that God brings into His church. And so this concept of double honor is not so much for the individual. It's not like, oh, we should hold the pastor and the elders in high esteem because they've been called to that position. No, no, no. The double honor is about more the calling, not the person. To recognize that the people that God uses in these positions are accountable and responsible for more than, than what we are as just the body of Christ by design, by His plan, and it's purposed. Those that are called into ministry are responsible for looking out for others. What this means is, well, guess what? Those that are in service, those that are leaders, elders, and, 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 and pastors have got lives too. Which means we have lives more abundant. Now you know what an abundant life means, right? It means whatever you have in life, you get it in abundance. So things like bills, <laughs> illness, family matters, jobs, marriages, car problems, mortgages, and all the other. Life abundant! We have all of those things that we carry within our own lives, but also the calling that God has placed upon us is for us to share that burden on your behalf too. And so it is something that has to be brought about by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, or it would crush anyone who is called to a position of leadership. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says that, that we're to obey those that rule over you. And be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. Now, see, that would be a great verse if I could just leave it there. I would love to just say, Obey! I'm watching out for your soul. But then it goes on. It says, As those who must give an account. ruh -roh. It says, Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you and so there's this relationship this understanding that by design it's not something to be avoided it's not something to be shunned it's not something to be to be cast out that the pastors and leaders and elders and those that serve in the ministry have got have got this responsibility instead it's to be recognized appreciated and as the word says even honored so let me share with you just a couple of of common examples of how this works practically within the church in order for us to kind of understand how it works. You need to realize that on any given week, any period of time, that the leadership of the church, and I'm not just speaking of myself, I'm talking about Dennis, I'm talking about those that serve in different ministry heads and positions, all the way down to those that are, that are watching kids back here right now and teaching in the children's church. They have things that happen through the course of the week based on who it is that they're ministering to. But what can happen is that there's a, the ability to be able to be caught up, to be involved in the life issues of many people within the church at one given time. We're involved with the good stuff. We're involved with the not-so-good stuff. We're involved with tragedy. We're involved with calamity. We're involved with, with great joy and expectation that comes from 
from wonderful events. So the spectrum and the gambit of everything that happens in relationship to the body, good or bad, affects not only the person in the body, but also the leadership overseeing the body. Now, before you think I tell you this so that it shouldn't be, understand, this is the way that it is supposed to be. This is God's design in relationship to leadership, to elders, to pastors, that we would be involved. It's not a matter of trying to see that there's a a sense of it being wrong. It's God's design for the shepherd to oversee the flock. It's God's design for the shepherd to be those that are involved in the health and the welfare and the tending and the nurturing and the betterment of the flock. It's by design. And it's empowered by the Holy Spirit, or it wouldn't happen. But there's a place where this design can fall down. And I believe that it's the reason that the Apostle Paul takes the time to address this specifically, because, see, all too often, pastors and other leaders can can come to this place of missing expectations. And when expectations are missed, when they're not met, so often and unfortunately the leaders within an organization can become the targets of dissatisfaction oh it doesn't just happen in churches it happens in any potential condition of leadership how many of us right now are really happy with the leadership on a national basis missed expectations creates a situation of not being satisfied with what's going on. And so see, it's not something that's uncommon, but in the church, there's a, there's a difference. Because whereas we may think at time to time that those that are leading us, depending on if it's in a job or if it's in a political situation or if it's in, in, in any other area other than the church, that they may not really care for us, and it may be true, not so in the church. Not so in the church. Because the leaders that are called to serve in God's house, that are doing as he says here, doing well, care. And God causes us to, and allows us to, and empowers us to do so. I can't tell you how many times that I've been involved with listening to somebody talk about how it is that the church has let them down. And I got to tell you what, there's probably nothing more harmful, nothing more more goes right to the heart of a pastor or a leader or an elder when they hear and they get the report that somebody is feeling like they've been disregarded or they've been abandoned or that they've not received from the church what it is that they felt was appropriate and right. You see, it's going to happen. Because on any given week, we can be dealing with all types of instances and aspects of the the life of the church up into and including things that may seem mundane because the weeds need to be pulled and the grass needs to be cut and a wall needs to be painted and the carpets need to be cleaned. And and, And if that was all there was to it, I would love to be a janitor. I know how to do that job. But there's more that goes with it. Here's how it can happen. Listen and see if this is unreasonable or not. I think it's very reasonable in relationship to how we get in this process. Somebody's missed church for several weeks. They've been away from church because they've been sick or they haven't been feeling well. Maybe there's just life issues that are going on and they've not been here for several weeks and no one seems to have noticed. No one called. No one reached out or stopped by or made an effort to see what was wrong. And in the eyes of this person, the church has failed because the church recogni- or failed to recognize a need based on absence. The problem is, is that the church very easily can be reduced not to its full strength, but to one or two individuals. You know who normally is the church when somebody's disappointed? You know who it is? I'm the whole church. Or Dennis is the whole church. Or somebody serving in one of the other ministries is the whole church that has now let someone down because of not recognizing and realizing that there was an absence. And guys, the first thing that I want you to understand is that there is no one, listen, please, there is no one in leadership that will ever purpose to let you down there's no one in leadership that will ever purpose to disregard there's no one that is called of god that is given the charge that 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 has been 
called into ministry to love and to nurture the people of God and the flock of God that is going to turn around and purposely say, I'm going to let them suffer. It's not in the heart and the nature of our shepherd, and it cannot be in the heart and the nature of those he calls to shepherd. The problem is, though, when someone has been let down, we find out about it as a revelation. As a revelation. And it's, and it's not a matter of something that we knew, it's something that we did not know. And because all of a sudden it comes to our understanding, we too then become hurt in knowing that we failed to, to meet an expectation, that we failed to meet an opportunity, that we failed to meet a need that was legitimately there. And guys, understand, the bigger problem is that as this happens, as we come to this place of realizing that a need has been met or not met, the enemy steps in and compounds it. The enemy loves to use and now be involved in turning what is an a issue into a major issue or problem within the church. Because now it's based on a failing. It's based on hurt feelings. It's based on, well, here's how it works. We find out that somebody has been let down by someone else. Very seldom does a person that is feeling let down call us And say, hey, you guys really blew it. I wish you would. I wish you would. I wish you would call me and say, hey, I've been gone for three weeks and you didn't notice. And I'll say, really? I was gone for two of that. Did you notice when I was gone? And we'll be okay. It'll work. It'll work out because we love each other. We don't want to see anything come between us. But we'll talk and we'll communicate. But most of the time what happens is, is I get a phone call from a third person. Did you realize? Of course I didn't realize. Had we realized, we would have done something about it. But we didn't realize. And so now, that which was a problem of somebody being ill, and here's what what was needed. Guys, understand, and this is not to diminish the the, the reality of this, because it's real. But what they needed is they needed in a time of feeling ill or being out of sorts and unable to come to church, they needed fellowship. They needed somebody in the body of Christ to be able to come and to represent them in relationship to how they were feeling. They needed someone to reach out to them. They needed prayer from the body. They needed support. They needed to feel like they were important and that then they were a part of something bigger than they were because they were struggling. All of that is doable. All of that is doable. It, and there's nobody here on anyone's behalf that would say, nope, I'm not willing to do that for somebody. And so if we think that somehow or another that there was a purposing not to provide that, then that's the enemy's intervention working in our hearts and our minds to try to break us as a body of Christ. Does that make sense? Because nobody's going to be in that type of situation and allow it to happen if they know. But see, now the problem is compounded. You see, it's no longer a matter that can be addressed with prayer and with comfort and with counsel and with consideration. Now there's hurt feelings, there's dissatisfaction, there's even sometimes disdain. There's now division because it's been talked about and amongst others within the body. I can't believe that the church didn't do that. Translation, I can't believe that the leadership didn't do their job. I mean, that's really what it, what it comes down to. And it's hard. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Well, this is why I don't say anything. (laughs) I'm a strong enough Christian. The last thing I ever want to do is bother one of the pastors. I don't want to be a bother. I hate that word, bother. (laughs) I mean, 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 it just sounds bad. You know, am I bothering you? Well, let me tell you how much it bothers me that you don't bother me. No. Because we don't want to miss opportunities to be able to minister. You know what? Prayer is one of the things that we look forward to. If somebody's hurting and somebody's down and somebody just needs encouragement, we want to be there to do that. Guess what? It encourages the leadership as well to know that we're being used. It's a part of how God has approached our position and our calling and understand that it's it's harder it's just, it, matter of fact i think that it's more harmful when i find out after the fact when somebody comes up and they say hey i was in the hospital for two weeks how am i supposed to deal with that well wow, that's great i'm glad you're here <laughs> no it's like well why didn't why didn't you call me you know what people say i didn't want to bother you 
It's not a bother. And don't ever think that it is. Don't ever think that there's a means by which somehow or another reaching out to other believers, reaching out to other brothers and sisters, reaching out to a pastor, reaching out to a, to, to a leader is somewhat bothersome. It's not. I'm going to try to use that word one more time and then get off of it. Bother, 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 bother. Okay, we're done. <laughs> but now you can see how if we allow something like this to happen within the body, within the church, and then compounded by the number of people that are just in this room. Do you see how easy it is for someone to be hurt? I don't want anyone ever to be hurt by a missing of an opportunity and withholding of an expectation. I don't want it to happen. It's going to. It does. But understand, it's not the heart of the leadership, and it needs to be recognized that in that sense that those that are called to lead carry an extra amount of burden on purpose, God's design, His plan. And again, don't hear, don't think that I'm telling you this so that you can feel like, well, we shouldn't bother, one more time, the pastor. Don't feel like that's what it is at all. As a matter of fact, it's more worrisome, it's more devastating, it's more damaging if you don't reach out. But we need to understand that the church is bigger than a pastor, than an elder, than a leader, than a Sunday school worker. It's bigger. As a matter of fact, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to have, we're going to have church recognition training. Look left. Look right. Back. And forward. Now look down in the seat that you're sitting there's the church in all of its humanity with all of its flaws with all of its glory that's the church and so we need to recognize that as a church if there's a part of the body that is suffering silently and guys this happens all the time when we look at this same kind of situation that takes place within our physical realm as it does in the spiritual realm. But you think about it, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but you know of situations you may even be involved in in it where you finally went for a test because there seemed to be something wrong, and all of a sudden there becomes this revelation that there is a problem that has been underlying, that has been silent, that has been growing, that has been, been, been developing in such a way. Or you go for that regular checkup, and that's why I go for regular checkups. There's things that I don't like checked that I get checked. I would just as soon not. But then I know that if it's not checked regularly, there could be a problem that's growing undetected. And guys, the same thing happens within the life of the church. The same thing happens. Whereas we need to be so cautious, we need to be so careful that we don't allow something to grow unnoticed, undetected, without bringing it out and looking for it and calling for assistance. One of the ways that we do that, well, we got lots of ways to contact the church. There's emails. There's Facebook. There's prayer chains. There's even a telephone. <laughs> and just in case we're not here, leave a message. I think it's amazing. And, and, and guys, don't be afraid to leave a message. If you call and you don't get somebody, leave a message. You know what happens when we just see that somebody called? The same thing that happens when you just see somebody called. You think, well, if they really wanted something, they would have left a message. <laughs> so leave a message if you don't get somebody. If you don't get somebody on the first couple of tries, try somebody else. Look at anybody in this room. They're all brothers and sisters. They're all part of the same body. If you're hurting in some way or you need assistance, then it's available to you. goes on. It says, don't muzzle the ox while it treads out grain. And I like this. Notice it doesn't say keep feeding the pastor even if he doesn't do anything. You know, the idea is that the pastor's working, that he's working hard, and it says that they're worth their wages. The idea being here that, that, that pastor's work is, is, is absolutely as valuable as 
anyone else's work and that there needs to be this understanding that the cares and the concerns of the pastor while are his or hers in relationship to leadership they're also the concern of the body because we're all part of one and the same goes on in verse 19 it says do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses you see part of this double honor is that you should not accept an accusation against leadership against elders unless it's valid now when you talk about an accusation realize that the author of accusations <laughs> is satan satan loves his position as the accuser and he's good at it it says that he roams around as a lion looking to devour that he stands day and night accusing the brethren now guys we live in a culture in a society that is very very big on accusation you know that i mean if you don't like something it, there's like no holds barred man we just like spit it out there and talk about what we don't like about people and we have a tendency to talk about people a lot the admonition here from the apostle paul says he says be careful because it's a it's a matter of a missed expectation or something that you don't agree with or something that you don't like be careful that you don't become those that would would handle it inappropriately and go to the place of of gossip or go to the, to, to the place of slander or being malicious and how it is that you're talking about folks and guys this applies to a lot more in life than just what happens here at the church but you see it's easy because we have expectations and when somebody who is called to meet those expectations fi fails to meet them then well we just feel like we ought to tell somebody about it do you know what the pastor didn't do let me tell you really well you know that sunday school teacher i just can't believe that they just you can fill in the blanks it says be careful it says not to receive an accusation so how do we do that how do we how do we not receive an accusation when somebody literally is talking poorly about anybody and i believe that the principle is universal it's real simple if you are talking to someone about somebody else rather than talking to the person that you're talking about stop does that make sense if you're talking to someone about someone rather than talking to that person stop it right then and there and if somebody is talking to you about somebody else then what you need to do is you need to say hey whoa whoa stop let's go talk to them you know what often happens oh well no <laughs> well wait a minute you're willing to sit here and tell me all the things that they're doing wrong why don't we go talk to them and see if that's really and see guys as brothers and sisters as those that are in christ jesus that's what we're supposed to do we're not supposed to get caught up into the situation to where we're not willing to go to a brother and sister that we're having a problem with because a lot of times the problem is not anything that's really a problem. We just feel the need to complain. Now, I know that doesn't happen here. I've just heard about that in other churches. <laughs> it's part of life. It's part of the programming that we get as we watch the world around us use accusation and and cast dispersion on people's characters very often without any validity, without two or three witnesses. God says that we're not to receive it. He says that those, in verse 20, who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. Boy, that's a rough verse. I mean, this is actually a call for those that are in leadership to... to to confront those that are doing these things that are bringing about false accusation that are that are that are talking out of turn and they're gossiping and it says hey you need to just put them on the spot in front of everybody wow i've had to do this on a few occasions it's never fun matter of fact it's very very difficult to do it in such a way that that the outcome is exactly what you hope it is. I mean, there's been a few times when people have said, oh, wow, I can't believe that I was doing it. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's the exception, not the rule. Most of the time when you confront somebody in that situation who is in the process of, of doing that which is gossiping or doing that which is destructive within the church, and you go to them and you say, hey, you need to stop, what you do is you wind up relocating the problem to another church. Because they leave. 
They get upset. They weren't heard. And a lot of times there's some validity on both sides of it, but how it was handled is not right. And again, it's never our heart to see somebody not have their needs and expectations met. It's never the heart. And yet so often, that's the way that it's presented. It says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice and do nothing with partiality. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking directly to Timothy and to other leaders, I believe as myself. He's saying, here's the thing. I'm telling you that you need to make sure that you are not doing things out of favoritism or that you're prejudiced in relationship to how you treat people. You need to be fair. You need to be right. You need to treat everybody well. And guys, understand, there is often a very, very fine line between what people see as favoritism and being fair. There's often a, far, a, a very fine line between what people think is prejudice and practical service. And I think it's important, so stay with me. Listen. So often in a church, it looks like that there are favorites. Wow, he's the pastor's pet. They're in the in crowd. There's cliques in the church. Now, you guys have never heard that here, I'm sure. It's never been an issue here. <laughs> often what you see that looks like favoritism is not favoritism because it's happening from somebody who serves freely. What winds up happening is that those that are favored are not those that serve. Those that serve become favored. Does that make sense? Those that are favored don't get called to serve. Those who serve wind up being favored, and they're favored first by God. You see, the service is unto the Lord. And so it's not a matter like, well, the pastor put him in that church cleaning ministry because he's the favorite. Does that make sense? You, you, you following me here? There is an in crowd here at Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley. There is. It, there, there's a click. It's, it's the in crowd, okay? They're the ones that are in service. Right now, right, there's some that are in the Sunday school classes teaching kids. There's some that are in... The, the junior, senior high classes. There are some that are in the kitchen, even right now, that are taking and preparing for the next, the next time that you're in the, the fellowship hall. So there's muffins and there's coffee and there's things that are there. There's folks that are, that are preparing stuff in the, the backyard. There was an in crowd out there today that set up the bounce house for the kids after service. And so if you ever feel like somehow or another that you're not getting the attention or that you're not in the in crowd, it's real service, look, or real simple. Look for something to do and jump in. And you'll be in the in crowd. Other than that, we don't have any favorites. I mean, I, I like all of you, love all of you about the same. Even me? Well, I guess I do have a favorite. <laughs> but let me tell you, it's just natural, it's just nature, it just makes sense that for those that are in service, that are laboring along with and carrying the, 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 the weight of this fellowship and the people here and are serving other people, that there's this aspect of depending upon and relying upon and appreciating. There are certain folks within this fellowship that, that I know without exception that I wouldn't be here if they weren't. It would just be too hard. There's folks that serve in so many different places. There's people that I know that I can go to and I can say, hey, I have a need. Would you, would you take care of this? I, I, can't meet, I can't reach this. I can't, I can't lift this. It's too heavy. Remember we talked about help here last week? What help is? I've got more than I can carry in this one portion I can't carry. Would you pick it up? And they're always willing to say, yes, I got it. I'll take care of that for you. Now, if that's favoritism, I don't know how to get around it. I mean, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how to get around that. But guys, understand that we need to be careful. There's not this aspect of, of picking and choosing who gets to serve. If you want to serve, we want you to. We need you to. Don't lay hands on anyone hastily or nor share in other people's sin. Keep yourself pure. Again, an admonishment directly to the leadership. 
You see, as your pastor, I am expected, as the leaders of this church are expected, the elders of this church are expected, you see, realize we have a code of conduct before the Lord. We have requirements. We have things that we stand responsible and accountable to before the Lord. That means that we have to do the things that we tell you to do. We have to practice what we preach. Does that mean that we don't sin? Nope, we're just a lot better at concealing it. No, it's just our sin is ours. It's ours, and we have to go to God just like you do in relationship to repentance and confession and receiving that forgiveness of God. But the fact of the matter is is that there's an expectation, and through the power of God and through the, the power of His Holy Spirit, we are able to take and to hopefully live out that which He has called us to do in such a way that I don't counsel you in your marriage or counsel you in your finances by giving you the name of my divorce attorney that also handled my bankruptcy. You see, that's not supposed to be that way. So there is an expectation of purity. There is an expectation of doing that which honors the Lord. Well, we're on a roll, so let's go into this next section because it's always fun to bring up alcohol. He tells Timothy, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Now, this is one of those verses in the Bible that is often misused in support of alcohol, even for pastors. Well, the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, the job's so hard, you've got to take a belt every once in a while. (laughs) It's not what he's saying. (laughs) Although I can relate. No. Paul's not contradicting what he said in chapter 3 when he said that overseers are not to be given to wine. What he's saying here is he's saying, Timothy, in referring to the use of alcohol or wine in this case as a medicinal remedy, take a little bit for your stomach. He's not talking about recreational use of alcohol. He's talking about alcohol in a medical sense for Timothy's upset stomach. The things that were happening, I'm sure, in Timothy's life and a young pastor trying to to hold down a church that was was much bigger than he was had caused him some problems, maybe even to the point where he had that whole nervous stomach thing. And the Apostle Paul says, it's okay to take a little wine for your stomach. But it's not an admonition to drink. And guys, it's alarming because there's a growing movement within the modern culture of the church that says that alcohol is not only acceptable, but it's something that even in some circles should be practiced. And it's difficult because there's always been a problem within our culture, within our society, even within the church, when it comes to the abuse of alcohol. There's also been the understanding that within, within pastoral positions and elders and leaderships. I mean, one of the things that, that, that happens here in relationship to each of the elders that are called to serve here is, is we talk extensively of what the Word of God says. Of what does it mean when it says not given to wine? What does that mean? What does it mean? It means that we're never going to find ourselves in any place, time, shape, that we are going to be under the influence of something other, hopefully, than the Holy Spirit. For me, it's real simple. I just don't drink. Don't ever have to worry about it. But let me clear the air. Let me tell you, first off, there is nothing in the Bible that says specifically that you cannot drink alcohol. There's not anything in there that says specifically you cannot drink alcohol. What it says is it says that if you do drink, that you're not supposed to get what? Drunk. And when people ask me, is it okay if I have a beer every once in a while? Is it okay if I have a glass of wine with dinner? I say, absolutely. You have complete liberty. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul even talked about the liberty that we have in relationship to alcohol. But what it says is it says don't get drunk. So between you and God, you can do whatever it is that you have liberty to do in your life, but be careful and don't get drunk. Well, I would never. The problem is is that who gets to determine what drunk is? I've seen some people that can drink an awful lot of alcohol. And still not necessarily think that they're drunk. Think that they're drunk. (laughs) I've seen other people that have a very, very low threshold for alcohol. 
And you know that they're drunk. So do we have to come out with some sort of Christian breathalyzer? <laughs> that lets you know which side of the spirit you can still refer to? <laughs> oh, I've crossed over into the wrong spirit zone. I have to stop drinking now. I mean, we need to be aware that there's a problem here. The Bible has all kinds of great examples of what can happen in relationship to drinking. As a matter of fact, it's interesting, over 200 times in the Bible, in the Old and the New Testament, alcohol or the drinking of wine is, is mentioned, and 85% of the time it's a negative connotation. 85% of 200 times that it's mentioned, it's a negative connotation. The other connotations have to do more so with talking about new wine, talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit, or the activity of the Holy Spirit, or using it like we see here in a medicinal sense. But there's not any great application within Scripture where it says, this is a great thing and practice it. In Proverbs 23, verse 31, it says, Do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Sounds like a halftime commercial, doesn't it? <laughs> Bubbles on the top of the glass. Whew, blow them off and enjoy a libation. If it's legal... If we're just not supposed to get drunk, why is it that the Bible says don't even look at it? Well, it continues in verse 32. Listen, because it says, At the last, it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies on the top of a mast, saying, Well, they've struck me, but it didn't hurt. They've beaten me, but I didn't feel it. I need to wake up so that I can have another drink. <laughs> if you guys know anything about me, you know why it is that I have a hard time. I am not a hypocrite because I lived through being under the influence of alcohol. I know what it looks like. In Proverbs 20, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I've been there. I've been right there. I was a complete idiot. <laughs> I was under the influence. And I was in bondage. Guys, I want you to know that I have never in my life, and now that I've lived a little longer, can say this with even greater conviction, I have never in my life ever seen a positive influence in a life where alcohol is concerned. Let me tell you what I have seen at best, at best, is an absence of direct disaster and calamity. Maybe at best that there's no negative impact that's visible in relationship to the person's life. And that's the best outcome that can happen. What I have seen though time and time and time and time again is the devastation and the destruction that comes from being under the influence of something that alters the mind, alters the reason, makes us unwise, makes us brawlers, <laughs> makes us those that are unable to cope with that that the Spirit would guide and direct. Now, at the end of the day, we have liberty, as the Apostle Paul said. But that liberty comes with restraint of the Holy Spirit knowing first that we don't do that which would cause somebody else to stumble, that we would not become influenced or under the influence of something other than the God that loves us and died for us. The principle is simple. Paul's not encouraging or authorizing recreational drinking by this verse, because this is how I've heard it used in some churches. Well, even the Apostle Paul said it was okay. If you have a stomach problem, and Pepto-Bismol doesn't work. See, they didn't have Pepto back in those days. All I can tell you is if, that if you drink alcohol and you ever find yourself being drunk, stop. Completely. It means that you have a tendency to go under its influence. And in so and by so doing, that you're doing something that dishonors the Lord. And it's not going to bring about good results in your life. All right. Verse 24, and we'll close here. 
Some men sin are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. The wisdom that's here talks about the example that we set. Some men's sins are evident. Some are really good at concealing their sin. Some men's good works are really evident. Some won't be revealed until the other side of this life. But the reality is, is that we need to recognize that the sin in our lives will find us out, be it that which is allowing pride to rule or allowing us to be under the influence or coming into a place of accusation. The things that we do in our life, whether they are seen by others, will be seen always by God. And we need to recognize that as His children, that His love, that the power of His Spirit will rule and reign in our lives if we'll allow Him. But we have to be willing. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we thank You. And Lord, may it be.